So today I am in Farmingdale State College uh, for my OLF. It's a beautiful campus. Uh, here all the campuses are really very beautiful. I'm trying to search for Laffin Hall where I have today my session to train them for how I got to Fulbright. It's all over the places. This is Thompson Hall. This is Gleason Hall. Okay. This is Farmingdale Street College. by Director International Affairs. So let's see where is Laughlin Hall. Very big campus. I think in almost 200 acres. So this is a college. So there are good people, those who help me. Let me see. I to walk straight. Beautiful campus. Ward Hall. Greenlee Hall. Need to walk this way. This is library. Greenlee Hall. Complete building is the library. It is Napal. in how like ultimately I got to Ooh. hello good morning good so here is Laughing Hall where I am going to begin with my OLF outreach lecturing so I have to go to the third floor so let me so this is explaining when well, no, all these are um, photographs of our students okay. who have gone abroad. There's also a contest okay. for students from other countries coming to America okay. that uh, our international students can participate in. Okay. So. Oh my God. Whose office is this? Okay. Well, okay. It's under, under construction. construction. Okay. Register our student accounts. Okay. Okay. So this is your office. This well, this is where Steph is the uh, office manager, office administrative assistant. Okay. okay. So then, to, uh, today she's not there. No, not my there. office is very messy. I was moving actually. <laughs> okay. But okay. I want you to meet my family. Oh. Okay. They're, uh, Okay. They're all there. I have those three girls. Okay. And uh, once upon a time, I 
competed in the sport of wrestling. Oh, is it? So, My uh, God, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so very active uh, international affairs director also. Yeah. Um, okay. And then I've, the years just, have, I've been very fortunate to travel the world. Oh, okay. So. Good, good. Okay. Farmingdale is the oldest public college on Long Island. It was chartered in 1912, opened the doors in 1919. Okay. During that time, there was very little development on Long Island. It was primary agriculture. Okay. Our earliest alumni were successful with um, raising chickens okay. and uh, growing roses. Okay. And um, yeah. very few people lived on Long Island, as I say. It was primarily an agriculture community. Mm -hmm. And then after World War II, yeah. all the GIs came back from Asia and um, from Europe and built on Long Island. And okay. Long Island expanded, and as Long Island expanded, so did Farmingdale. And they actually had a, a branch campus, if you will, in Farmingdale for an engineering technology. Okay. And eventually engineering became a primary focus for the institution. Okay. Uh, it was originally within the State University of New York as an um, agricultural institute, then a college of agriculture and technology, and now uh, simply a college of technology, the only remnant of our past with the agriculture is our um, horticulture programs, uh, including um, landscape development, um, and the newest program is a certificate in uh, cannabis production. In what? Ca cannabis. What, what is that? Cannabis. Um, it's marijuana. Okay. It's, it's legal in New York okay. State, and okay. so it's a, it's a booming business. Okay. And um, so we... At one point in the 1970s, there would have been 15,000 students. Okay. But there were two community colleges, Nassau Community College and Suffolk Community College, and all three offered two-year degrees. Okay. So Farmingdale made a transition from two-year to four-year, okay. and it was very painful. Enrollment went from 15,000 down to 5,000. Okay. And um, I've been here for 21 years. Okay. When I came in 2003 as director of admissions, okay. uh, we were at the low point. Oh. Um, when I left as director of admissions after 16 years, we had topped 10,000 students mm -hmm. um, who were primarily commuter campus. Okay. So um, having more students means more services, yeah. more parking, um, more of everything. Right. And so the college grew, and uh, we're in a very good position now. How much total campus area is today? How, what's that? Total campus area. Total oh, area. I don't know. We'll have to look and see. I don't Approximately know still? I, I couldn't tell you okay. because it's very big. Because when I was walking in, I saw that it's very big spread. Well, area. the campus center is is not so large, mm -mm. Uh, but then you have athletic fields okay. all around. Okay. You have some of the there's a, a golf driving range, okay. and then there's actually property that's part of the campus okay. that extends because we border on Bethpage State Park, okay. which is a very major park. Okay. It hosts the uh, major golfing events at Bethpage Black, okay. and um, but the, uh, the campus itself, the central part of the campus, is, uh, is very small relative to a larger institution like Stony Brook. Okay. Uh, on Long Island, Stony Brook is a university center. Old Westbury is a college of arts and sciences, an education college, mm -hmm. if you will. Farmingdale is a technical college. And then you have the two community colleges in Nassau and Suffolk. So those are the five State University of New York campuses on Long Island. Mm. Um, but the State University of New York has 64 campuses. Okay. Altogether, 33 okay. community colleges. Oh, okay. So, so how, uh, tell me now, because I was uh, just confused about when we say pathway courses and we say associate programs. Now, this is the two years program, as you just now said, that you two have, you were having initially all two years program and suddenly you had to take the decision to be four years. So, how, how what is that uh, transition, like a pathway course and then uh, two years, this associate program. So, little elaborate on that. Well, the, the two year programs that remain main um, are there because they serve for a uh, college which will be near to me where I am residing. Actually, I am residing in now Long Island and I was thinking instead of wasting my time all the time in traveling because I saw the kind of traffic and all is there, I thought it would be better I should look for something which is very nearby and I can uh, share my thoughts, ideas, experiences and of course most important motive is to learn from others. 
So, Dr. Hall, I'm very much uh, thankful that you have given me this opportunity and others faculties and others those who have come. Thank you so much for joining me here. And uh, it's a great, great opportunity for me to share what we do in India and what is it, it happening in America as well as in other parts of the world. I'm standing before you not only as a Fulbright member, but then I'm also standing before you as a member of Indian River Basin Council. It's a national level river council where we have developed some river manifestos because as you all know that across the globe, most of the, almost 75% of rivers are all drying or they are dying or they are mostly polluted. So my presentation also is understanding science and non-science dimensions. Because mostly it was felt that these kind of studies are only for the science students. Basically in India also we understand that way. So non-science students like politics, history, geography, English and other subjects, uh, they are not much bothered about these science kind of you know, understanding. Because today all of us talk about climate change, all of us talk about rivers, all of us talk about so many aspects. But without having a proper understanding of science behind. If we have the understanding of science, then I think we have understood the things in a better manner. For an example, like I am now doing work also as a Fulbright, I am working on the wastewater treatment plant of New York, which is of 275 million gallon capacity. But when we talk about wastewater <coughs> treatment plant, as in your country, in my country we call it as sewage treatment plant, but here we have already started calling it as water resource recovery facility. That means instead of doing the treatment of the wastewater, we have started making it into the form of recovering the resources. That means like we are recovering gas and we are recovering other nutrients for the purpose in using it for the other purpose. But the main purpose of the treatment plant is to treat the sewage. But all system has gone flawed. As I will go through the, take you through the journey of my doing work, you will, I will also show you the treatment plant and how things are working and what needs to be corrected. And each one of us can easily play a good role to be a solutionist. And that is what is my motive to stand before you and uh, to present the things. So, uh, to be very uh, responsible, I always believe that first of all it should begin from me. And that's how I started and uh, how it works and how what are the different uh, 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 things which is around. If you can Google search about it, a lot of things you will find that almost all the SDG goals we are trying to cover up under the social, economic and environmental aspects. All the 17 SDG goals. A lot of skill development and women empowerment and many things we are doing. Right now I'm not going into the detail of what my institution does because a lot of information is already available in Google and you can see for that. Now, how this journey began of the Fulbright? Because this is also very important. How do we develop our international relationship? How do we... It's not important just to become a Fulbright. This is what is being done by Farmingdale and I would love that if I can propagate the good things of Farmingdale in my country or in other countries also as well as as much as we can develop the international relationship. That I would like to take it out. You can see those letters which I could get then after BCC has also given. It's only because not as an individual capacity, uh, not, not only on a professional capacity, but individual capacity as well as as an international and national body member that I could uh, provide some support to uh, BCC CUNY for this weather station propagation in India, across India. And, now, uh, the, uh, with that, I saw that BCC first got a very good amount of uh, you know, funding from the government. And now that fund is also doubled after we could successfully do that one program. And that's what is the potential of the collaborations. You saw in the first uh, slide uh, there, it was my first introduction to BCC, commu uh, BCC uh, Community College. And uh, then uh, that's how further we took our relations now this is the area which you are seeing is a Palghar area. It's a rural area in Maharashtra where we, we could do a lot of workshops 
with the local people uh, in the area, that means the farmers, the colleges in the vicinity, so that many ambassadors we can create. It's, uh, we, we cannot keep the knowledge confined to us today. We have to bring in more and more uh, people. We have to, you know, uh, engage in these sort of work so that we can cover more vast area. And the down two pictures which you are seeing, these two pictures which you are seeing, are the way we transact today education. And uh, training and grooming with which a cadre is the cadre building is done. And at a time, 108 rivers simultaneously we are trying to do the rejuvenation in one state itself. And the cadre building means I am, if I am the state hero, uh, Jal Naya, we have Jal Karni, Jal Dut, Jal, uh, Jal Premi, like that, the cadre. Like somebody who will be heading the district, somebody who will be, uh, district means what you call it as, I think, county. So, uh, district, then blocks, like that, you come down to the rural areas. Okay. So, at every level, a cadre building is done. Each person will be identified from the place who is very much doing a lot of uh, work in community and interested in doing. Can be sprayed when on these water bodies which has got polluted because mostly in the Long Island all the water bodies are getting covered by the algae because of lot of phosphorus, nitrogen. Okay. Now these things we can get rid of if we practice this, what I said. It's a very, very simple. Every college in every department, you can do this. You have to just keep a drum in that. That means that much multiple. Suppose it's a 10 gallon, so multiple. So that is why you have to be very careful while you are doing something now. So these are the very, very important learnings which we have got. And that's how I'm trying to show here. Just I was talking to uh, Dr. Jeffrey Gap that uh, in BCC also, I did not start with the science class. I started with the geography, history, philosophy class to make them understand how they can also connect to these activities. Because this is more about sociology. This is more about understanding the geological aspects and most important about getting to the solution is to know about the history of the place. History of the things. Unless you know the history from where it has started. Suppose I am today doing about the river. I have to know how the civilization had come up from the river banks. What was the reason? Why did civilization start from there? And today what we have done? We started from the river bank. But today we have restricted these rivers into the walls. If you will see in New York area or any other area, Hudson River or any river which is flowing, it's flowing between two channels. And all the sites there is concretization, buildings and many more have even included inside the water bodies. And today government is requesting them to go out so that restoration measures can be done. But for that again they are paying them some you know compensations and all. But Already that was wrong. It was an encroachment on the river lands. So we have to understand. We have to give the space for the rivers. Compulsorily rivers should have its own river land. And that's the reason today we are seeing when we are in Long Island or in America more than me. You people are experiencing the weather situation. Where is snowfall? Now that is also reduced. Look at rainfall. It was so scanty. And only one day when it is happening, it's like an atmospheric river, funneling of the rain and that's how getting flooded. But throughout how it has to be, it is not that kind of rain which is happening. So total erratic rain, very scanty rain. That's how the news was also appearing that Mississippi River even is getting dry because of less of rainfalls. So look at the impacts. Whatever happening here, maybe what is happening in India, don't think that it's not going to impact somebody else, the neighboring countries or the other countries. It's, you have also realized about the fire which had happened in the forest. The smoke which had come towards us. So this is all what is happening because of the climate change. So we have to be very careful when we are doing our teaching learning as well as if we are looking at any issue. We have to look at a very holistic <coughs> 
uh, <coughs> situation. Now I am trying to show the irony of my country as I stand before you very proudly because I am invited here and uh, I am trying to share my expertise with the college in the, by means of co-teaching, uh, team teaching and even going to the different uh, universities, colleges, meeting with the river keepers and many groups, those who are working in the field also and even to the government administration but at the same time in my country, of course we are trying our level best but see we have gone up to the moon and we could you know predict exact time when it was to land satellite exactly we did it so we know everything but see the flip side i have written but still there are many places which are deprived of the even basic amenities and Problem of not having water, at least for the soils, for for the plants, for the trees, it was very problematic for us, especially regarding parks, because you need to make sure that everything stays in a good shape. Where whatever it's, it can be the trees, the animals, because we have animals in many many different places. So yeah, we're already facing that problem of of water and. Yeah, yeah, so is, is it as a part of your study that you were conducting or as per your well, interest? No, no, it's just my, my work as a, a student job that I had. So, of course, I'm interested in that. I wouldn't be out in the box if I was not a bit interested. But, yeah, it was mostly just for work. And so it's... Which park you did the work, you said? Uh, in So, in the, the town I'm from, I was... We have many, many green areas and parks, so it was among almost all of them really. We just go around, make sure everything is fine in most of the parks, so you get to see many of them, many very different. Some are very small and some are really, really big, and it's interesting to see all of that. And you can do and stuff like that. It's when you work there and you see that every day, it's uh, I don't know, it's, it's a bit more... What do you feel that in today's young generation, what is required that uh, which can bring the focus or the senses of the young generation that now we have to take charge of these things and uh, the corrective action is very much required because when just now you said that when you go to parks and you see garbage here and there or people are not caring for... So, what do you feel? What is needed? Because it's today, it's such an emergency morning we were talking about that there is a living planet report. If you go through the living planet report, you will come to know that at what rate the animals are becoming extinct. And extinction means we can understand that anything from our um, like uh, food chain, you know, we all are interlinked. So, if any organism is getting extinct, it's a big kind of an alert signal that we are at a very crisis and already uh, like fifth extinction happened we are almost on the verge of sixth extinction so from that point of view today i thought that uh, i should that's why i just came to farming dale to meet all of y'all so want to know you are going to be flying so uh, what do you feel because from up when you will be seeing like you know today a lot of forest cover is also disappearing it is very important because I know like my, my dad's in um, trawling and because of that I, I know you mentioned from above but in the waters like the it's just like the even like the oil drilling is out like the business has gone to nothing because like, there are no fishes the vibration and everything is just like moving everything up yeah so it's like it definitely is like degrading um, but like I don't know how else like what you can do to fix it because it's like people are benefiting from the drilling and the countries are improving and at the same time it's you know like no, but that drilling is that the drilling is also not now enough. So that is why now from that drilling they have now moved to more like towards the mining. Where mining, they are trying to get more of the metals, iron ore, ore and irons and all. Because now from those metals, new, new things they are trying to come up with. Like suppose earlier there was no electric cars. 
automation was not much in the car and others now for that lot of metals required for those chips and all making and in that process now lot of metals and this like uh, is being ex extracted from the soil mountains so like earlier we went ground straight down to get this crude oil now we are also trying to extract more of the aquifers now what you are drinking all beverages i have not seen anybody drinking yeah water rather you people are all drinking all those beverages so like coca cola and other whatever the products which you people keep drinking so they are all made up by, may, are being made out of those aquifer waters and how do we now stop this extraction of these aquifers that is also a big issue so from that point of view we have to all so you can also little express your views that what do you feel about how we have to make corrective actions in the nature what well, that's what i said that today when i look at all the water bodies which are because we have plenty of water we see but will you dare to go into that water earlier everybody used to jump into the water to play you used to love going into the water today neither swimming kayaking fishing nothing can be done because waters are also becoming polluted at the same time the situation which is there is really very terrifying so what do you feel that in nature what you can do for the nature or you are doing something um well i don't know it's interesting i was reading this isn't doesn't necessarily directly relate to like the water and stuff but i was reading like articles online about electric cars versus hybrids and whatnot and it's really interesting happening where I am from mm. it's not happening here it's happening abroad so it's not really my problem mm. so mm. I think it's like one of the main issue mm. and to come back on the the, the lithium drilling uh, I was in Australia mm. Five years ago, mm. and they had the same problem because they discovered a massive coal uh, thing underground, and so they were starting to think about a massive project to extract coal. But it was a natural disaster, so it was very conflicted because uh, it's a very important resource that has value for the country, but at the same time, this trying to extract this has like a very an immense cost on the people living there and on the nature and on the animals and so it's very problematic because for some people these economic advantages are still overcome these environmental issues so I think that's and like a puzzle right together mm -hmm. again that was about 10 going on 11 years ago the main purpose of the house was to be used for public outreach a few training workshops and really get the surrounding neighborhoods, community, and campus, faculty, staff, and students included, aware of what you could do to your home and on a larger scale your business to save on your energy costs. From you know electrical to, to heating, whatever the case may be, that was the main purpose of this house when mm -hmm. it was built. Mm -hmm. So it was transformed to actually our offices um, for quite a few years. Um, upstairs we have three bedrooms, which if it's not too much construction, I can show you. Uh, and we use those offices, or those bedrooms, excuse me, as our offices. We just recently moved out of here to Lupton Hall, right across the big lawn. Mm -hmm. And now a different department, I think, is coming in here in the next few months. Hence all the construction going on. Um, when that will be, who knows. But for the time being, we're still using it for public outreach, little tours like this, and what have you. Um, in our garage, we use it for our solar photovoltaic hands-on training workshop where we take about a day or a day, or a day and a half. We use a mock roof that I built with our instructor and we just pull it right out into the driveway, which is right around the bend here. And we install literal solar panels on this mock roof just to show them the whole process, how to do it efficiently and safely. Yeah, so. Okay. So first, here we have a smart thermostat. Mm -hmm. We have an identical one upstairs. Mm. So we're able to control heating and cooling in two zones. Second floor and here on the first floor. Okay. What's nice about the smart thermostat is that you can set a schedule. If the Wi-Fi or the internet connection is fine, you can connect to your phone and set a schedule. 
Say you're traveling, you're going on vacation, and you don't need the house as hot or as cold, you can save on those energy bills for that week or two weeks you're gone, whatever it is, by setting the temperature appropriately. Right. Um, you can set the schedule also from here, mm -hmm. if you would like. Right. Yeah. So I'll do it myself. You can choose the days of the week or okay. single day of the week that you would like. Okay. Say we just want weekdays. And then at different points of the day, you can set the temperatures. Okay. Right. Again, pretty simple. The more updated ones you'll see with your Amazon Alexas or your Google Homes or Nests, where mm. you can talk to the device and set mm. the temperature as need be. Okay. Um, nice. The house heating is natural gas. Mm -hmm. And then we have central air um, run electricity for the air conditioning. Okay. So that's your sources of heating and cooling. I see cameras also some different. I have not mm -hmm. seen this model. Yes, like because we are on a university, a state university campus, mm -hmm. those are from university police, just making sure you know no crimes are committed, okay. things like that. We have two inside, okay. one and two. Mm -hmm. We have one on the porch and about two or three on the exterior of the building, okay. as well as in the driveway. Okay. At the time, they were more efficient for the time being. It seems like every year these devices are, or appliances are getting 1% or 2% more efficient. Mm. Um, everything does work. Smart plugs. This one's from a company called Jasmine. And I think mm -hmm. we have one or two laying around from Schneider Electric. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is you can plug in an individual uh, appliance. It could be a microwave, it could be a lamp, whatever the case may be. And you can get the individual electrical draw or reading that that one single device is consuming. Okay. You can get it emailed to you, you know, based oh. on a weekly or monthly basis. I don't find these personally to be too useful unless you see a very big spike in your electric bill mm -hmm. and you want to find out, hey, where is that coming from? Mm -hmm. You put one of these on one of your larger loads and if you see that, hey, it's really, really high, there's probably your issue. It might be time to maintenance the refrigerator, the dryer, washing machine, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So, most people wouldn't, tool. wouldn't take the time. As she was coming in, they were just finishing. And you can set a control or control the schedule of when those blinds go up and down. Helps with any glares coming into the building or the house and helps a little bit with heating and cooling of the of the house depending on the time of year. Okay. So it's something with either the electronics oh. or the connection. Oh, look at that. And the reason they're facing this way is because this is facing south and you get the most direct sunlight. Which is a perfect transition. I set that up nicely. Yeah. <laughs> to that solar thermal application. Yeah. Okay. So the solar thermal application or the evacuated tube system. These are? Correct. These about dozen and a half tubes. Okay. So there's a liquid inside of those and are mm. usually a reflective metal coating on the inside. So when the sunlight hits it, all the material inside is heated up and travels up the piping or mm. up the tubes into the piping of okay. the system. Okay. The piping goes down into the garage and into a storage room which holds a domestic hot water tank. Mm. That water is then now or is now warmed up and is held to be used throughout the house. Okay. Any supplemental heating that the water may need can be done with oil or natural gas, but for the most part okay. it is easy right now. Okay. And then if we take a few steps back. We have the solar photovoltaics. So we have okay. heating on the left. Okay. Now we have strictly electrical generation on the right. Okay. This was the 5.2, 5.3 kilowatts I mentioned to you earlier inside. Okay. So when the sunlight hits those panels, oh. the electricity is generated in form of direct current, mm -hmm. which then has to go into what's called an inverter, mm -hmm. which inverts it to alternating current mm -hmm. that is used in the grid. Okay. much experience with these this technology in particular but I do believe it is cycling okay and then when it is heated okay goes up so obviously at what night, is it called as that what that tubes are called as uh, they're called evacuated tubes evacuating tubes evacuated tubes. evacuated yep. or tubes. A, is a solar thermal application okay there are other applications for solar thermal you might mm -hmm. see on a few houses in the neighborhood flat yeah black yes yeah. yes but what's nice about this house again that it became as a modular home, mm. we were able to face it directly south. Because mm. in the northern hemisphere, mm. the more direct sunlight you get is in the southern, is facing south. Yeah. So as you see, our applications for solar are facing south. Mm. Right. There's a um, Institute for Research and Technology Transfer, IRTT.
a chair cushion? Yeah. They had developed a wheelchair cushion that had an IRTT that would be very helpful to people who were chair bound. Oh, there's a lot more in the IRTT now, I'll tell you that. that. that was All right. All right. Okay. Back, yeah. Farming Day in 1936. See. <laughs> well, a mile and a half from here at Republic Airport. Okay. There's actually an air power museum there. Mm. I used to um, live in Bethpage. My parents are still there. It's right down the road. Oh. And um, in Bethpage, they built. You know, let's, uh, we'll just peek in here, real quick. Yeah. Dr. Donnelly? Yeah. That's my colleague, Dan, who's running the class. Okay. As well as the descriptions below. Yeah. I can get you some of those, I okay. believe, in, yeah. in a printed form. That... Right. My wife is a school. Yeah, yeah, so they can afford it. Yeah, it was just up on the North Shore in Greenport, 3D printing. But, like, as you can see, you know, a lot of training equipment, a few 3D printers. Um, we have a wind tunnel uh, simulator over to the right. And that big blue oh, device. Yeah, yeah. What is that big blue device? A wind uh, it's a wind okay. tunnel simulator. Okay. There's a few of the 3D printed projects on the mm -hmm. table there. Mm -hmm. Incredible. 3D printing just blows me away. We're mm -hmm. printing houses now in 3D. Yeah. Yeah, there's one on Long Island a few years ago, 3D printed. Mm -hmm. And there's a 3D printer chugging along. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, a, that's just incredible. Mm -hmm. This is just a basic one. Okay. This is also chemistry. This is a typical classroom. This is a typical classroom going on. Uh, let's see, um, because of our mission, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, these, these aren't the fields because yeah. the I 20 to register for courses, mm. and by the time that happens, yeah. Courses might be filled. In fact, Jeanette is working with the three students from Europe, mm -hmm. and um, I know that the registrar told her that one of the one or two of the classes the students wanted, there's no room. There's so, a conference room, I think. Yeah. Have a look and. But it's been a few years now, but. This, this hallway was in tremendous disrepair. Okay. And they came in and they, they did a nice, uh, a nice renovation and then they added um, a seating area for students. Um, mm. So on that end is the architecture. Okay. The construction management department. Mm. Uh, we can, we can done here. We can do. Take a picture too. Here is a typical class going on. Mm. Um. Okay. Are you familiar with ABET? Oh, yeah. Yes. So all of our engineering technology programs um, mm. are ABET accredited. Okay.
Okay, so SUNY is with 64 campuses. I was thinking CUNY is the one because they have been telling that they are the most biggest because they have 18 to 20 campuses, others they don't have much. So I was thinking whether SUNY is big or CUNY, how it is? Well, SUNY has existed only since 1948. Hmm. So SUNY is very young okay. as an institution. Many of the SUNY units hmm. have been in existence for uh, 200 years. Okay. Um, because some of them, they were, in New York they had uh, teaching colleges hmm. called normal schools. Okay. And so many of the normal schools became SUNY campuses. Okay. But, yeah. in fact, um, hmm. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the land-grant colleges. No. Okay. So, after the U.S. Civil War, hmm. in I think 1867, right. Congress dedicated money to build educational uh, colleges in various states and they gave them what was called a land grant. Hmm. And so the University of Michigan, the hmm. University of Wisconsin, hmm. um, Oklahoma State University, Iowa State University, hmm. many of those colleges received land grant funding hmm. and that's what propelled them to be the institutions they are now. New York did not have hmm. a state university, so Cornell hmm. University became hmm. a land grant college. Land Grant College. Land Grant. Okay. And um, that's why today hmm. there are two parts of Cornell University. Hmm. There's the public side, hmm. um, the statutory colleges, hmm. and then there's also the private side. Hmm. Now, the statutory colleges are not part of the State University of New York, okay. but they, um, they are part of the state system. Okay. So you don't pay SUNY tuition. Mm -hmm. You don't pay Cornell tuition, you pay tuition kind of in the middle, okay. more toward Cornell. Uh, okay. But there's the veterinary college, the College of Labor Relations, the College of Human Ecology, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Mm -hmm. So those are very specific to Cornell. Okay. All right, so we're going to go down this way. So she was telling the Department of Aviation. So is this Department of Aviation also give the pilot training? Yes. So we have our own uh, this choppers and all, um, or we have, we have a our collaboration. Own fleet, own, own fleet of planes. Okay, yeah. we have our own fleet plan. <laughs> oh. Every public airport. Okay. Okay. Right. Because the other girl I met, she said that she was doing her uh, administrative management then in aviation. So aviation, uh, aviation course administration be. is a business focus. Yeah. Um, you do take some of the courses that the pilots take, but uh, hmm. the pilot program hmm. is expensive. Okay. For an international student, in addition to the $35,000 for tuition fees and the like, hmm. um, they also incur flight fees of $9,000 per term. Oh. So for a flight student, it's $53,000 for one year. Okay. And... Uh, Automotive engineering section. Hmm. Yes. Not, not so much of an emphasis these days at all. Mine's just let out. I heard him get out. Alright. Okay. So, so what so, they are taught in this? Yeah. Well, I don't know what's on the board. But <laughs> okay. I'll show you. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to end with that trainer over there. So okay. I want a demonstration. Okay, okay. All right. So we'll start back here. So three trainers here. Mm -hmm. Total, probably just over 100 grand. Funded by a grant. Identical in terms of their structure, but mm -hmm. they can be customized to. Let me back up. These are electrical trainers. All these cords, electrical wires that can be hooked up throughout these different little modules mm. here mm. to do anything as simple as turning on a pilot light to stopping and starting a motor mm. down here, right, or down here. My favorite part about these trainers is that 
you can customize the exercise or exercises mm -hmm. you want to do by just simply popping these in and out of place. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to do stop start lights with emergency buttons, well, you can do that. If you want to start up a motor, you can do that using a different array of cam switches or overload relays, for example. So the electrical students really, really enjoy this. But mechanically moving parts, mm. as well as in our mechanical engineering technology department. So we like to, when we buy equipment, if it can overlap into two different curricula, that's perfect. In this case, you can set it up to understand rotation, uh, rotational speed, based on how, okay, I'll run a quick experiment for you guys on this one. Wow, take two minutes. Mm -hmm. But just to give you a, a quick run through of what this is. So, this is our nacelle trainer. So, I know I've said the word nacelle a few times, but really didn't explain it. So what a nacelle is, is the big box on top of your wind turbine tower. Mm -hmm. That houses essentially everything but the blades and the tower itself. So this is a much, much smaller version of that on the ground, again, rather than 400 feet in the air. So moving from left to right, we have our blades mm. in our traditional three-bladed system. You have what would be called your, what is called the gearbox. Yeah. From the gearbox, you would have, not really easily seen here, but what you have is your high-speed shaft connected to your generator to generate electricity. Right. Everything here is more for the hydraulics of the whole system. And then below is what we call, this big gear here mm. is what we call the yaw, Y-A-W. Okay. And that turns the system based on the, where the, the wind is coming from. Because you want your system to be facing the wind to capture as much energy as possible. Right. The small gear is mm. connected to a motor, which is called the yaw motor. Right. That's what gives you the power to turn the yaw. Mm. Right? So before I get the demonstration started, your blades spin very, very slowly in the grand scheme of things. The low speed shaft is a shaft, okay. again, all, all initiating from the source of wind, which could be a few meters per second, typically. Okay. So again, you can have two students working on this for troubleshooting exercises on each side, so four mm. total. Okay. What, I'll show, what I'm going to be showing you can all be controlled from this touch screen right here. Mm -hmm. There are a few on uh, grid tied connection systems that you could operate over here, which I haven't played around with much. Mm -hmm. So I'll just stick it to here. And then up here in this little box, we have a wind vane, which is simulating your wind direction. Okay. And a wind anometer, which mm -hmm. is gives you a visualization of how okay. fast the wind is going. Mm -hmm. And really more for show, you have your aviation obstruction lights so your planes don't hit your yeah. wind turbines. Yeah, yeah. That's for demonstration <laughs> Yes, only. exactly. So what I'm going to do here is reset all of our alarms. Perfect. So on this main screen, gives you a ton of information. Gives you an uh, approximate wind direction as well as a wind speed in meters per second. Mm -hmm. You have your input speed, your output speed, the gearbox temperature, and if we wanted to, there's a vibration sensor you could put on the gearbox. The reason you would want that is because you want to limit vibrations as much as possible to yeah. you know, lower the risk of any damage to your pieces of equipment. Um, what else do we have? It tells you when the blades are moving or not moving, as well as your angle of your blades. Um, and then other than that, here, also the direction your wind turbine, where your yaw is positioning. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be based on the wind and the wind direction I set on these steps. So this trainer, you can set up to 10 different steps. I'm just gonna do three, because three gives yeah. everyone a pretty good idea of what we're looking at. Yeah. You can set the time of each step, mm -hmm. the wind direction. As we move from step one, two, and three, we should see really two things happening. Wind speed increasing, which you'll hear, um, and the direction of your wind turbine, which you'll see, change. Right. Okay? Right. So what I'll do is I'll start the wind Hello. I have to start the trainer first, excuse me. Um. Hmm. And you'll start hearing the, the uh, gearbox starting to go in a minute. Okay, we have our wind simulation. 
is on stage one. I'm going to start. I'm going to go to our main screen. And we're going to put it in automatic mode. Okay, initializing. We see our yaw turning into the direction yeah. of our wind. Yeah. Which I set for should be about zero degrees or 365, which is what we have, zero, in step one. Right. Now our blades start to turn based on how fast our wind is going, or simulating. And you can now see the gears in that gearbox filled about halfway with oil mm. starting to turn. Okay. And you see our high speed shaft spinning faster than the low speed shaft. Mm. And what else we can also see is at what percentage our generator is generating power. Right now, because our winds are not, our blades are not moving, it's at zero. But it should be showing an increase in that percentage, although it wasn't showing me the other. And we'll go one more step. We're turning our system again, which is indicated by this wind direction portion up here. And as you hear, our anometer is starting to speed up a little more because we've increased our wind speed. And we're at 180 degrees now at 10 meters per second. And one last thing, you see how slow we are in rotations per minute in our gearbox inputs at 20, yet we're almost at 900 RPM on the way out of the gearbox. Mm -hmm. And that's really where you start seeing that generation of electricity begin. And this is one of the simpler things as a distributing or transmitting that electricity across mm. to homes and businesses. So and is there also the blade size? Because a lot is being discussed about the blade size, which is also affecting many birds and all. Right. And there is also a movie in our country, there was a movie made mm -hmm. that whether we require these wind wheels, because they are ultimately, mm -hmm. you know, affecting, because that radiation, mm -hmm. as well as the blades, they right. affect these uh, uh, birds. So the size of one blade for an mm -hmm. offshore wind farm is about the length of an American football field, 300-ish oh. feet, mm -hmm. give or take. Hmm. There have been ideas painting one of the three black so the birds can see them more easily. Hmm. Um, I actually don't know what the statistics are on how many birds actually, you know, fall victim to this. Um, it could be a lot, it could be a little, I don't know the exact number. Um, and by the same token, as someone who, I'll be a little biased, as somebody hmm. who is a fan, and no pun intended, a fan of <laughs> these, these wind turbines, <laughs> yeah. you have birds that are flying into buildings with clear glass. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. So that's, that's our so, wind energy lab. Wow. We have a geothermal trainer over there, too. Oh. Okay. That's an older piece of equipment. The resources we have, right? So how many students are there presently enrolled for this course? Uh, this Wind program? Energy has one mm -hmm. in the certificate. Mm -hmm. okay. I think so, yes. Well, no, I checked yesterday. Yeah. I was looking at... Energy certificate. There's, I think right. there's one. And what about the micro for wind? We're kind of like, I know it's been on and off. Oh, yeah, courses. that one. They don't show that on the application results. On the in Which I actually okay. used. Now, one of my first few weeks. Is here. that part of the uh, renewability? How, where does that fit it in? in terms this? Of this is, was used in a thermodynamics class within okay. MET. I don't know if it's still used, okay. um, but it could be used in our geothermal class, which for the temperature of both the water and the, the, system, uh, the air coming out based on if you're in heating or cooling mode, which you can choose from this. Oh. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I used this, like I said, once or twice when I first started as a demonstration. ये जो आपको देख रहा है ना ये जमीन नहीं है वो लोग छत पे हैं एंड छत पे ही इतना खूबसूरत गार्डन हो सकता है मैं पहली बार देख रहा हूँ डिटेल्स बाद में बताऊंगा बट ये नींबू का पेड़ देखिए ये नींबू का पेड़ कितना पुराना है इसको सर चार पाँच साल हो गए क्या बात है पाँच साल में एक सब मासिक 
एंड द बेस्ट पार्ट इज हम लोग रूफ टॉप है पूरा अब मैं आपको एक सर पे ज्यादा सरप्राइज दिखाऊंगा राइस फील्ड जो छत पे ग्रो किया गया है इट इज ऑल ऑन द रूफ टेक्निकली इट इज पॉसिबल क्या बात है दिस इज एन एक्सपीरियंस ये सब रूफ टॉप है जमीन पे कुछ भी नहीं है मैं सब आठवें माले पे हूँ आपको दिखाऊ प्रूफ करने के लिए ये देखिए छत पे पवई लेक पवई लेक दिख रहा है आपको आगे ये सर जो पावर बुक यूज करते हैं ना यहीं से बनाते हैं सर गोल्डन रॉड वगैरह हाँ ये देखिए छत पे खेती किया गया है मैं आपको पहली बार दिखा रहा हूँ लोग पूछते हैं कि छत पे कैसे खेती हो सकता है वी हैव बहुत ही कल्चरिस्ट विद अस फ्रॉम दापोली इज द एक्सपर्ट लॉन तो हम मेंटेन इजिली कर सकते हैं प्लांटेशन कर सकते हैं एंड हम मिलते हैं बैंगन का खेत छत पे बैंगन उगाए हैं क्या बात भिंडी भी आ गया है अभी निकले जाए बात ऑफ दीजिए ये हार्वेस्ट हो चुका है राइस एंड ये हार्वेस्ट होना बाकी है स्केयर क्रो है जो गिर गए हैं उसको भी सीधा किया जाएगा अनबिलीवेबल <laughs> Oh my God! I'm seeing this. I think पहली बार मैं ऐसा मुंबई में एक छत पे आया हूँ जहाँ राइस की खेती हो रही है अनबिलीवेबल शायद गानों का शूटिंग भी हम यहाँ कर सकते हैं किसी को भी गाँव का शूट करना हो या यहाँ पे आइए मुंबई में आई इंट्रोड्यूस यू टू द टीम ये देखिए दिस इज जस्ट अमेजिंग जल्दी आपसे मिलता हूं बाय